Well, I don't know if you guys have ever uh, seen the movie A Christmas Story. Um, if you haven't, you haven't watched TNT on Christmas Eve because it's probably still going 24 hours. But there's this one scene that I like to call my Ralphie moment. And uh, if you remember that movie, the whole movie, he just wanted a BB gun for Christmas. And his mother kept saying, you'll shoot your eye out. And of course, he finally gets the BB gun and he goes and does a little target practice, bounces back, hits him right in the eye. Um, and I, I love that moment because his mother's reaction to it and just how, the, you know, everyone was interacting. But I, I love another moment in that movie when, remember when Ralphie gets in a fight and he's afraid his father's going to kill him. And even his little brother hides under the sink and she says, Daddy's going to kill Ralphie. And he's waiting for the hammer to come down. And, and when his dad comes home, his mom kind of covers for him. And she, she makes it not as big a deal, and that brought a bond between Ralphie and his mother. Well, when I was about 11 years old, I had this moment. Um, we had just moved from Haver, Montana, to Post Falls, Idaho. And I literally grew up in Haver at five, six years old, shooting gophers with a 22 off my porch. Um, I wasn't used to neighbors, okay? So that's my defense. If you've been to Haver, you can see a long ways. But all of a sudden, I had these neighbors. And one day, um, I was looking over the fence, and I recognized that, man, my neighbors have a ton of pigeons in their yard. And no one likes pigeon poop, right? No one likes that. So I was going to be the good Samaritan of the community. And my, my mother had passed down a pellet gun to me. And this wasn't just some, uh, you know, Red Rider BB gun. This was from the 1920s. And it was my great grandpa's. And it was a Benjamin Franklin pellet gun. So, I mean, it was the real deal. <laughs> like, it was basically shooting a 22. And I did my neighborly duty and I shot those pigeons. Little did I know, the cages in their yard were there for a reason. <laughs> that my neighbors had been raising these pigeons to sell, like, you know, at weddings, just the pigeons go off and stuff. It was a bloodbath, I'm not gonna lie. And uh, I was thinking, like, I just did my, you know, neighborly duty, and all of a sudden, my mom, we get a knock on the door, and my mom comes down and she says, hide the gun and hide yourself. And there was a police officer at our door. And I went, we had this little crawl space under the stairs, and I went and hid the gun, and I hid in the crawl space and listened. And the cop says, so do you have a son? She says, yes. And he says, does, does he have a pellet gun? And she goes, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, well, we have a report from the neighbors. And she just goes, yeah, that, that wasn't us. And I was like, way to lie, mom. Like, way to go, right? She covered for me, totally covered for me. I did get in trouble, by the way, from her, but I didn't get in trouble by the cops. And I remember thinking that day, my mom is for me. That was a special moment. Now, if you're upset at my mom lying, some of the early church fathers thought it was okay to lie if you were protecting someone else. St. John Chrysostom says, it is possible then to make use of deceit for a good purpose. So from now on, we're calling her St. Val. St. Val, right? She was just covering, and really what they're talking about was like when criminals would be getting chased and they would cover them and then share the gospel with them is what they would do in the early church. But mom covered for me that day. And I think as we celebrate Mother's Day today, we're gonna look at our original mother. And I don't mean Eve. We're gonna look at Mother Mary. I had this interesting moment because Mother Mary can be controversial in Protestantism. It's not in Catholicism or Anglican or Eastern Orthodox, but when the Reformation happened, one of the things that kind of got put to the side was Mother Mary. You know, the, the controversy is do you pray to her, like whatever it is. And that's not really my goal today. But I did have an interesting moment about five years ago when I was meeting with the Catholic priest. I just wanted to, you know, start meeting with different priests in town and pastors and asking them questions. And I'll be honest, kind of snootily, <laughs> I said... So what's the deal with Mary? I said it just like that. Can you believe that? First time I met a guy. So what's the deal with Mary? Why are you guys praying to Mary? And he looked at me very kindly, and he said, the difference between us and you Protestants is we actually believe Mary's alive. Oh. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, we believe in the resurrection. We believe Mary's alive. We believe all the saints are alive because they're the cloud of witnesses, and they are participating with us in the renewal of the kingdom. And so we actually believe she's alive still. And that actually made me 
think differently about this. And that, again, that's not my goal today, but I do think that through the Reformation and in the Western church, we have not honored Mother Mary that well. But my goal again today is to show you that no doubt she is the new Eve. She is the mother of all of us, but she was also partnering with God. And as a mother, you are like Mary. You are partnering with God in life in the kingdom. One man writes this, concerning the title mother of God, misinformed Protestants will often say, nowhere in the New Testament do we ever see that phrase mother of God. She is never called the mother of God. True, but the word Trinity never appears in scripture either. But even more fundamental is the reason this title, Mother of God, was given to Mary to safeguard the divinity of Jesus Christ, who is God. See, that was the biggest controversy coming out of the, when the church started, was uh, there were certain groups of Gnostics and other people who were saying Jesus never was in the flesh, and he never had a mother. And so they had to safeguard that, because really, if you don't see that with Mary, then we're, we're neglecting the divinity of Jesus Christ. And so Mother Mary was very important to the early church, because they really viewed her and Jesus as one. She carried the word of God. And that when they shared the same, just remember, Jesus didn't have the genetics of his father, Joseph. He had the Holy Spirit and the genetics of Mary. They became one. So it's incredibly important that we see her for who she truly is as the mother and the example of all mothers. So we're just going to walk through different passages with Mary today. And I want to show you, again, that it's not just about her, but it's about what she did for us in this model that she has given us. So we pick it up where Mary is engaged to Joseph. Huge age gap there. Most likely Joseph was about 30. She was about 14 or 15. Now, I know a lot of people think that's weird, and, and the Christian church did were the ones who changed that, by the way. One of the things, reasons why, though, you guys can understand is because men died. <laughs> like, people were living into their late 40s and 50s. So uh, they, they basically set up this system for that reason. But if you were engaged, you didn't really see each other for six months to a year for purity reasons. And so her and Joseph really weren't talking that much together uh, until their wedding. But the most important thing to know about Mary and Joseph, but we'll focus on Mary, is she came from the line of David. And in the Old Testament, it said the Messiah would come from the line of David. And they can trace Mary's ancestry all the way back to David. And so she's sitting here. And she's just, you know, focused on her wedding, and she gets visited by the angel Gabriel. And angel Gabriel comes and says, highly favored one to Mary. And we're going to unpack that today, why she was highly favored. But this still had to be um, scary, obviously. I always laugh in the Bible when you read, and it says an angel shows up, and they were afraid. And then the angel always says, do not be afraid. And it's like, I'd be afraid, <laughs> right? Like, if, I'd be afraid of that. But she, he, he says, do not be afraid, higher, highly favored one. Not only are you going to give birth to the son of the most high, but your cousin Elizabeth is with child as well. And Elizabeth was well in years, and she was gonna give birth to John the Baptist. So it's this beautiful, beautiful scene, but we sense some worry in Mary. Why? Well, obviously, it's because she was a virgin. She was a virgin, and the reason that's important is because this was going to dramatically affect the social status the rest of her life. In that culture, if you had a baby out of wedlock, you were pretty much excluded. It's not, it's not like you couldn't come into the synagogue, but you were pretty much put into a certain camp. And that camp you were put into was the harlots and prostitutes. And so when Mary is, is worried in this moment, it's because she knows she will literally be excluded for the rest of her life. Now, let me show you the genius of God and the restorative plan of God. So why do you think that Jesus hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes? Because his entire life, one of the only groups that his mother was welcomed into was the prostitutes. And so Jesus hung out with them his entire life, hence why they felt comfortable with Jesus, and hence why Jesus stuck up for them. And so this was not some small thing. This was going to affect Mary for the rest of her life. But she was highly favored, highly favored. And one of the lessons we can learn is that in our life, there's a ton of persuasion on how you should be as a mother, how you should look as a mother, how you should act as a mother. But let me tell you, nobody sees the deep, intimate moments that you ladies have. Nobody sees that but God. And God says to you, highly favored 
one. All of you women here are called highly favored. But obviously she's confused, she's worried, she doesn't know what's going on, but listen to her response. This is such a great faith response. Verse 38, and Mary said, behold, the Lord's bondservant, may it be done to me according to your word. I want you to know how important that was, and we're gonna break this down, that Mary is the new Eve. Eve said no to God, Mary said yes. Mary was literally restoring the planet. She was literally bringing life back because she said yes. But not only that, but she was also fulfilling Israel. So I wanna show you something crazy. I've told you this before, that Jesus' mission was not just to fulfill one side of humanity, it was also Israel. Everything Israel failed at, Jesus um, fulfilled. And Mary was a part of that. So when she says, behold, your bondservant, she was fulfilling every woman in the Old Testament's vision for the future. Listen to Hannah. Hannah was a woman who could not have a child. Um, and she comes to the, or the prophet comes to her and he says she will be pregnant and she says, I will dedicate this child to the Lord for the rest of his life. But listen to her response. She says, let your bondservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went on her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So Mary is not just fulfilling one thing. She's actually fulfilling everything Israel could not. And Israel, or excuse me, Mary's yes changed history in the positive direction, while Eve's no changed history in the negative direction. Mary is the new Eve, the new Israel, the new mother of life. Jesus is born, and we find out at about 12 years old, they have to go into Jerusalem for Passover, and so that was just a common theme. No matter where you lived, you would always travel to Jerusalem for Passover. And we see this scene that after Passover was over, they can't find Jesus. And for three days, they search for Jesus. Now, again, I, I, always, I don't wanna laugh at this moment, but I think looking back, we can kind of have some fun with it because we see Mary is very panicked. And anybody who's ever lost a child you can almost feel in your stomach right now, right? I used to drive my mom nuts because we used to go to Kmart, Blue Light Special, anybody remember? And while she'd be shopping, I'd go hide in the clothes so she couldn't find me. So my mom's had that feeling lots of times. But this is an incredibly important moment because Mary's freaking out. Here's the deal, this was elevated because it's one thing to lose your kid, she lost the son of God. Can you imagine the stress? that she must have. Well, finally, after searching for three days, they go into the temple and they find Jesus. And listen to Jesus' response. And he said to them, now remember, he's about 12 years old. Why is it that you were looking for me? How do you moms feel about that? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? How do you moms feel about that? And yet they on their part did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and he continued to be subject to them and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Jesus is my savior, Jesus is my God. But I have to admit, he was kind of being a little stinker there. Oh mother, why art thou worried? Did you not know where I would be? That wouldn't fly with my mom, I'm not gonna lie. But it's interesting to see what he did here. He did fulfill the law. The law says you were to submit to your parents, and even though Jesus was God, he submitted to his parents to fulfill the law. But I love that when it says she treasured all those things in her heart. I believe fathers and mothers are obviously different. Um, I do think women feel things differently, and I'll kind of explain that when we get to the, the wedding at Cana. But moms treasure things differently. Like, like my wife will bring certain things up about our kids, and I'm like, that has never crossed my mind. And I love that Mary right there said, I treasure these things. This moment I treasured in my heart. And in Christ, you mothers have that same experience. But we see Mary growing as a mother as well, and Jesus and her had a real relationship together. Jesus has grown, and we find out that he has a few disciples, but he hasn't gone public yet. And they're invited to a wedding. Now, there's a lot of views on why they were invited to the wedding. Uh, most likely, Mary, because Joseph had died by now, Jesus was about 30 years old, and Mary was related to these families. 
But back then, the same way your marriage was a big deal and not being pregnant before that, weddings were a huge deal too. It was all about preparation. It would party for days. Three to four days a wedding would go on and it was really a community event where everyone helped. But it was also social status. If, back then, if you didn't have enough food or drink for your guests, it was looked at as you weren't expecting them and you don't love them. It was a huge deal how you prepared for your guests. So you had to have not just enough wine, you had to have extra wine. So basically, it's just like weddings today. It's all about the guests and not about the bride and groom. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, it's out of control. We all know it's out of control. And I have done over 30 some weddings now and to see the fear that happens at a wedding. <laughs> but most time, here, every time I meet with a bride, I give her one piece of advice. I say, how's the wedding planning going? And she's like, oh my gosh, this person wants this and worse this person wants that. And I go, whose wedding is it? And she goes, mine. I go, then you don't have to do anything that you don't want to do. There's still this pressure today, but back then, it was incredibly heightened. And so this party's going down, we don't, you know, it's like the first day, and they're already starting to run out of wine. Whispers start going out in the back kitchen, and Mary hears it, and Mary comes to Jesus. I love what one the theologian, he's a great at history, he says, women were often closer to where the wine and food were prepared. Thus, Mary learns of the shortage of wine before word reaches Jesus and the other men. Why was Mary highly favored among women? Because she was thoughtful. She was compassionate. And instead of shaming the guests, instead of being like, can you believe what these people are doing? Before word can get out, she goes to the one person who she knows can help, her son Jesus. And she says, Jesus, they're all out of wine. And Jesus says, ma'am, what does that have to do with me? Now I'm gonna break that down in just a minute. But... The reason Jesus didn't want to do that miracle is because he knew his first miracle would start the clock to the cross. As soon as he did his first miracle, he knew the cross was coming. And so he wanted to make absolutely sure that he was doing the Father's will, not just his mother's will. And he needed to make sure in this moment. I love how the movie The Chosen, I don't know if you guys have seen The Chosen, but it's, it's fantastic. And the wedding at Cana is one of my favorite scenes because it just gives you the visual of how close Mary and Jesus were and just this intimate moment between them. So check out how The Chosen did this. It's just fabulous. But I'm not the wine. But it's only the first day. Yes, and it's all gone. Not a drop left. Mother, my time has not yet come. If not now, when? Please. Do whatever he tells you. How do you say no to that? It's a beautiful human moment. It's a wonderful, wonderful moment where Jesus looks his mother in the eyes and he says, yes. Now, he did call her ma'am. That is not what you called your mother. It wasn't rude, but that's not what you called your mom. And what he was doing there is he was saying, yes, mother, you're my mother, but I'm also the Messiah. And he was starting to make this separation for her because he knew she was gonna see some things as a mother that she probably wanted to fight for her boy. But he says, Mom, we have two different things going on here. I love what one man writes about this. He says, her words may be polite, Middle Eastern way of implying that he should do something. Guests were to help defray the expense of the wedding with their gifts, and it seems that their friend needs some extra gifts now. Again, I want you to appreciate Mary as if, if you're a parent, especially a mother, as your kids grow up and you have to start letting go. You have to start letting go. Mary went through that same thing. That same thing. But Mary teaches us a major lesson here. She trusted in the sovereignty of God. 
She said, be it at your word to the angel. But right here, she also trusted in the compassion of her God. In the compassion that, that there is a plan that God has, but it should never stop us from being intimately persuasive in a way. And again, I love that scene because we don't know if it was the right time. It seems like it wasn't the right time, but God made it the right time to honor his mother. Beautiful, beautiful scene. I love what St. Basil the Great says about this. He says, O sinner, do not be discouraged, but have recourse to Mary in all your necessities. Call her to your assistance, for such is the divine will that she should keep in every kind of necessity. See, here's the thing that you need to understand about Mary. Mary was the first disciple. Mary was Jesus' first disciple. She had watched him grow up. She probably saw some cool little miracles he did when he was a kid, and she had to treasure it in her heart. But the main thing she did is what? She just obeyed and trusted Jesus, and she turned to them and said, do whatever he says. The way she's the first disciple is she was already pointing people to Jesus. It wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was Mary. Mother Mary was Jesus' first disciple already sharing her son with the world. We see this again in Matthew 12. Mary and Jesus' brothers want to come see Jesus. He's out preaching now and the crowds are all around him. And someone yells to Jesus. And again, this is a hard moment. Someone yells to Jesus, your mother's here. Your mom wants to see you. And Jesus replied, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And extending his hand toward his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Again, sometimes we can take this and think Jesus is being rude. He's not being rude here. He's actually lifting Mary up and he's honoring her because what he's saying is whoever does the will of my Father, who was the first to do the will of his Father? Mary, when she says, be it unto me as you say. He's actually honoring her because Mary said yes, because Mary had Jesus, we are all brothers and sisters through Christ. We are all mothers and sons through Christ. And so Mary is actually getting honor, honor here because he said yes, she is my mother, and she's also your mother, and your brother, and your sister, and your child, and he's bringing the human family together once again, because Mary is the new Eve. She's the new Eve. And so already, he's pointing them to this new family. Karl Barth, the famous theologian, said this about Mary and Jesus. He said, the nativity mystery conceived from the Holy Spirit and born from the Virgin Mary means that God became human, truly human out of his own grace. The miracle of the existence of Jesus, his climbing down of God, is Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary. Here is a human being, the Virgin Mary, and as he comes from God, Jesus comes also from this human being. Born of the Virgin Mary means a human origin for God. Jesus Christ is not only truly God, he is human like one of us. He is human without limitation. He is not only similar to us, he is like us. Again, Jesus is not putting Mary down there. He's actually lifting her up and saying, behold the new Eve. And because she said yes, all of us are family once again. I mentioned this at Easter, so I'm not gonna go over it again. But the next scene we see with Mary, she's standing at the cross. Again, I can't imagine, I can't imagine watching one of my children get crucified. Not only that, is Jesus was innocent. He was completely innocent. And imagine the slander that Mary had to hear for her entire life about her son. Not only when he died, but after he died with all the persecution. This was an incredibly hard moment. But in this amazing scene, we see Mary and the apostle John. And Jesus looks at Mary and says, Mary, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And that's incredibly important because I mentioned this on Easter that we always make it like John was just taking care of this poor widow. It was more than that. Who did Jesus trust the most in his life? Mother Mary. And so he was also saying, Mary, please take care of John. And John ended up writing these ama this amazing gospel and multiple other books, and they believe it was a direct testimony from Mother Mary. So Mother Mary helped write John's books. That also includes Revelation. So I'm gonna end with this passage from Revelation. And again, you've heard me say this before. Revelation's a tough book, you guys. There is a ton of symbolism, a ton of things going on. 
but it mentions Mary in this. So again, picture this the lens. Jesus came to restore Eve and Adam and Eden. He came to take everything bad in the Garden of Eden and flip it into something good. And so that's the lens we're reading Revelation 12 in. So he writes this. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Do you think John thinks we should honor Mother Mary? And she was pregnant and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven crowns. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and hurled them down to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male, who was going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up this is important, caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished 1,260 days. So let me explain all of this to you. Just kidding. Obviously, this is hard stuff, but this symbolism is important. There's a lot going on here. He's talking about, this is why I'm telling you, Revelation isn't just about the end times. It's, it's all of time. This is what all of time looks like, and he's bringing this together. He's talking about the garden. He's talking about Eve. He's talking about the serpent, and he's saying how Christ and Mary flipped this whole thing. Mary was actually fulfilling Israel here. The 12 crowns is the 12 tribes of Israel. The Song of Songs says this in verse chapter six. Who is this who looks down like the dawn, as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, as awesome as an array, as an army with banners? So again, you gotta, there's a lot going on here, but Eve, excuse me, Mary is the new Eve, but she's also Israel. And so when it's talking about this serpent, when it's talking about this dragon, it's also representing Egypt. So the birth pains, the birth pains is when Israel was left Egypt and they had to mature, they had to grow, they wandered the desert for 40 years. One man writes this, in these words we have the dragon doing what Pharaoh did to Israel. And again and again in the Psalms and the prophets, Pharaoh is spoken as of the dragon. Nor is it without interest to remember that Pharaoh's crown was wreathed with a dragon the asp or serpent of Egypt, and that just as the eagle was the ensign of Rome, so the dragon was that of Egypt. Hence the significance of Moses' rod being turned into a serpent. So let me bring this together. Why this is important is he's saying for 1260 days, Mary was covered. The early church viewed Mary and Jesus as one. She was carrying the word of God. So for 1260 days is what? Three and a half years. It's saying God protected Mary and Jesus for three and a half years so his ministry would not be destroyed by Satan. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place. Where did they go hide when Herod tried to kill him? In the wilderness in Egypt. Where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years, away from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent hurled, this is important, and the serpent hurled water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opens its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon had hurled out of his mouth. Revelation's super easy to understand, you guys. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. So obviously there's a lot of symbolism here. Mary did not fly on an eagle like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, okay? Okay. That would be amazing. But there's so much symbolism we have to understand here. All he's talking about is nothing could stop the plan of God. Nothing could stop the plan of God. And when it says the serpent hurled out water, that means insults, that means slander. That means for even today, it's lies about Jesus. It's lies about who he is. It's lies about what he did. So that's the slander. That's what Satan's hurling out like water. But it says the earth helped her. The earth helped her. 
What this is referring to is when Jesus died, the earth swallowed Jesus up, and then he brought all humanity out. It's the reverse of Eve is what's going on here. As I said, he's taken us back to Genesis to fulfill it. And here's one of the most famous icons of Mary and Eve, where Mary is stomping on Satan's head, which was predicted in Genesis 3. I love this picture. I love this picture. Because Mary is consoling Eve for what happened. And she's consoling her, saying, I am the new mother, I am the new Eve, and I have defeated Satan through my son, Jesus Christ. Jesus and Mary were co-partners in redemption of the world. I love what St. Ephraim says about this. With the body then that was from the virgin, Jesus entered Sheol and plundered its storehouses and emptied its treasures. He came then to Eve, the mother of all living. This is the vine whose fence death laid open by her own hands and caused her to taste of his fruits. So Eve, the mother of all living, became the wellspring of death to all living. But Mary budded forth a new shoot from Eve, the ancient vine, and new life dwelt in her that when death should come confidently after his custom to feed upon mortal fruits, the life that is slayer of death might be stored up therein against them. Let women praise her, the pure Mary, that as in Eve their mother, great was their reproach. Lo, in Mary their sister, greatly magnified was their honor. Of him the Lord said that he had fallen from heavens, the abhorred one, the serpent, had exalted himself, and from his uplifting he has fallen, the foot of Mary has trod him down who bruised Eve with his heel. Mary literally flipped what Eve had done. And here's the amazing part. Because Mary carried the word of God in her stomach, it says now you and I have become one with Mary because we carry the word of God in our hearts. Just like Mary, we are carrying the word of God and we say yes, yes, be unto us as you have said Lord God. So let me bring this all together and how Mary is the new Eve and how she restored everything with Christ. Irenaeus says this, what is joined together could not otherwise be put asunder than by the inversion of the process by which these bonds of union had arisen so that the former ties be canceled by the late. It was that, that the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. For what the virgin Eve had bound fast through unbelief, this did the virgin Mary set free through faith. For just as Eve was led astray by the word of an angel, so that she fled from God when she had transgressed his word, so did Mary, by an angelic communication, receive the glad tidings that she should sustain God, being obedient to his word. And if the former did disobey God, yet the latter was persuaded to be obedient to God in order that the Virgin Mary might become the patroness of the Virgin Eve. And thus, as the human race fell into bondage to death by means of a virgin, so it is rescued by a virgin. Virginal disobedience having been balanced in the opposite scale by virginal obedience. Mother Mary is to be held in high regard because she literally flipped everything everything that was cursed in the garden. So should you pray to Mary? I don't know. If you want to, you can. I say, I would highly suggest you research it and see why that got started. But that's not my point of the sermon. Can we admit that maybe we have not held Mother Mary in high regard like we should? Can we at least admit that in the West we have kind of thrown Mary aside? when without Mary, there would be no redemption of mankind. Here's a side note I just threw in here. It's controversial for women to preach. Some say they should, some say they can't. In the New Testament, there's places they do, there's places they don't, and I don't have time to break all that down. So here's why I believe women should preach. If a woman can hold the word of God, she should be able to share the word of God. And that is my stance. So band, come on up. The bottom line is this. Eve said no, Mary said yes. 
And to all the mothers in this room today, by saying yes to birth, you are saying yes to Jesus because we're made in the image of God. And you have helped the kingdom grow and you have advanced God's kingdom. Even knowing we're all being born into this crazy world, it's having faith that we're turning our kids over to God. And that's where we put our trust. And if you can't have kids, I wanna say I'm sorry. I have got to talk to many women over my course of my ministry who just can't figure out why God won't let them to have kids, and I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. But let me say this, the word lives in you. Christ lives in you. And you can be like Mother Mary and say whatever he says, do it. That is the heart of a mother, turning them over to Christ. There is a lot of pressure on what women should be. Men have not helped. Here's what you need to know, women. You are highly favored. You are highly favored. Jesus did not have to choose to be born from a woman, but he did. And he chose Mother Mary. And you are sisters, daughters of Mother Mary. And so let me proclaim you are highly favored among women. Augustine has this great line where he says, there is a great mystery here, that just as death comes to us through a woman, life is born to us through a woman, that the devil defeated would be tormented by each nature, feminine and masculine, as he had taken delight in the defection of both. Women were the starters of the restoration of all mankind. And so today as we take communion, what Mary did was say, I accept your word. And today as we take communion, what you're saying is, I accept your word. I accept your word. And be unto us as you say in your word. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do this in remembrance of him. But also give honor to Mary at least today for saying yes, yes when Eve said no. And now we can live in the kingdom and the restoration through herself and through her son, who she's pointing us to, Jesus Christ. Happy Mother's Day. Don't forget to go get pictures together. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>